Dan White. Please welcome. Hello, everybody. Hanging in there? Yeah. Okay. All right. Friday at three o'clock. Okay. So very briefly, for those of you who, who don't already know me, I'm Dan White. I'm the executive producer of Filament Games, and Filament Games is a game development studio located in Madison, Wisconsin, that exclusively develops educational video games. Uh, we have a staff of uh, just over 40 people, and uh, that includes everything from programmers to UX artists to researchers to teachers. And we've been at this for about eight years, um, and while it was um, very gratifying and, and a super huge honor to win the award yesterday for Best Gameplay, um, I'll be the first to say that I think that we have a long way to go in this space, and that we're just kind of scratching the tip of the iceberg with what we can do with this technology. Um, so what I'm here to talk to you about today is Reach for the Sun. Excuse me, the award-winning Reach for the Sun. <laughs> Not to be confused with uh, the album by The Dangerous Summer, which notes itself next time, avoid search engine de-optimization. Uh, this takes up the entire first page of a Google search, and I don't even know who these people are. Uh, so Reach for the Sun is a game about plant growth. So in this game, the player takes on the role of a plant, and you start as a little itty-bitty seed, uh, whether you're a sunflower or a toad lily or a squash, and you collect resources and build out the parts of your plant, and your goal is to fruit as many seeds as possible before the cold embrace of winter, which inevitably happens. Your plant will die. If you haven't played the game, you need to know that now. It's not a spoiler. Your plant will die. Sorry. Um, let me show you a little bit of game footage here. So uh, what were our goals with this project? When we sat down and we envisioned this game, what was it that we were actually trying to execute on? Um, the first thing was that we decided that making games that are both educational and enjoyable and engaging is a piece of cake. That's sarcasm. So we decided to add a third a mission objective, and that was to make the game beautiful. We wanted the player to have a really, really beautiful, enjoyable, aesthetic, and auditory experience. Um, Ultimately, I, I think the idea was that we wanted the player at the end of the game to feel like they had just taken a really nice walk out in the woods in nature. Had that kind of warm, fuzzy feeling that you get when you've been outside. Um, I don't know how many of you are from the city, maybe this means absolutely nothing to you, but there's this thing called nature, and uh, you can go into it, it's very pleasant. Uh, the other thing is that we wanted to um, give the player an opportunity to step into an identity that they otherwise would not be able to access without the use of technology. And we wanted to approach plant growth from the perspective of a real-time strategy. So each plant in the game basically represents kind of a different tech tree. And instead of harvesting Vespian gas, you're harvesting nutrients and water and minerals. We also wanted the game to be able to act as what we call preparation for future learning. There's a, a brilliant guy named Dylan Arena who's done some really nice research in this area. I recommend you read his stuff. But the idea is basically that the game provides this really rich, visceral context that can be built upon later through further instruction, whether it's lecture worksheets or interpretive dances. Uh, we also wanted to, um, this is actually really more of a question what we didn't want to do. We, we 
didn't care so much about teaching academic vocabulary. We didn't care so much about whether or not the student knew the definition of a xylem or a phloem. Um, the game actually does have a dictionary. It has an almanac in it. It's very beautiful. It's animated, but nobody ever uses it, and that's perfectly okay because that's not really the point. It's a, it's a systems game. Another thing that we want to do avoid is some of the perils of the past. Um, Reach of the Sun was developed on the heels of another game that was a bit of a face plant. Uh, actually, I think the designer might be into it, so let's call it a, a best intentions, but didn't work out. Sorry, Matt, if you're out there. Um, so this game was essentially, Body Command was kind of a collection of mini games, um, and the, the experience ended up feeling very disparate and disjointed. With Reach for the Sun, we wanted to put all of our energy into kind of one cohesive experience and one cohesive set of mechanics. Uh, so let's talk about development. I'm sorry, let's not talk about development. I cut that for time. Let's talk about what happened in the classroom once we took the game into the classroom, because that's really actually what we care about at the end of the day anyway. So some good things and some bad things. Um, one of the bad things uh, was that stuff like this happens. You go into the classroom, no matter how much you've queued your game, some student's going to figure out a way to break it in a way that you never possibly anticipated. Uh, it's hard to see what's going on here, but there, this student made like four plants and areas that we didn't, or flowers and areas that we didn't think he could make flowers. Um, and it's, this is kind of one of the risks that you, won, that you run when you create a dynamic system game as opposed to something that's on rails. On the flip side, what we saw was instant engagement. So the students come into the class and they're talking with each other, talking with the teacher, and then they sit down and the game comes on and it's like, <laughs> everybody's on task immediately. And this is nothing too new to us because we've been pilot testing games in the classroom for years, but when we talk to people who have not had this experience, they're always really amazed at how quickly it happens. Um, our tutorial could have been better. We, we presented blocks of text like this and teaching how to grow your plant and how it works, how photosynthesis works, etc. And guess what? Um, students didn't read the text. <laughs> uh, <laughs> they didn't read it. And the funny thing is that those very same students that didn't read the text later complained, like, I don't know how to play this game. What the heck? <laughs> it's like, well, that's how it works, unfortunately. Uh, they won't read it, and then they'll complain about not knowing what to do. And that's our problem, not theirs, quite frankly. Uh, so let's talk about the music. So um, the music was really nice, really soothing, but what we did anticipate is what happens when there are 20 uh, computer labs all playing the same music at the same time out loud. Uh, could have been a cacophony, but fortunately with Reach for the Sun, the music actually all came together into one larger symphony, and it was actually quite, quite beautiful and soothing. Um, this is a, a screenshot of the radial menus, which I think are now fixed, but for a long time, um, like this game, it's amazing. I, I bring this up just because it's amazing to me how a single UX decision can actually bring an entire gameplay experience to his knees as this radio menu did. I'll give you a second to read this. Um, this one I, I wanted to, to put out there verbatim just because this is one of the most powerful things that we see when we take games into the classroom. And that is that the teachers consistently come up to us and they tell us that the students that they've had the hardest time engaging or are struggling the most see the biggest gains from the intervention. Uh, who can tell me what's wrong with this URL? I won't be offended. It's okay. In a classroom context. Yeah? Um, it's hard to spell. No. It has games with it. Exactly. Right? You take this into the classroom and they pull it up on the computer. Oh, games. That's no good. Denied. So, you have to do something about that. Um, paired play. Uh, this is, um, this gets my official awesome as always seal. When you have two, two people playing on the same computer, enjoying some, so they engage in this really rich dialogue around the game, and it's always beautiful. Um, this is another thing that is awesome as always. A teacher comes up and they say, what are you doing right now in the game? Uh, why did you just do that thing that you just did? And they, they help build scaffolding around the gameplay experience. Unfortunately, we forgot to include a pause button. And so the teacher comes up, and, and, and the game is fast-paced and furious, and the students can't take the time to talk to the teacher about what they're doing in the game. Um, so this, this was kind of another face plan we created. So Reach for the Sun is pretty, um, pretty taxing on, on uh, computer, especially old school computer hardware. And so we created this dialogue interface right at the beginning of the game that lets the student set it appropriately. Well, what do you think everybody choose? <laughs> ultra! You ask the student, do you want low? Or do you want ultra? <laughs> everybody chooses ultra. And so everybody's game experience is going at like five frames per hour. 
Okay, so unanticipated outcomes as a result of uh, taking this game in the classroom. So one is that people got really attached to their plans. They got super attached to their plans, and then they were really upset with us when we killed their plans over and over and over and over. It was also very cool when uh, Toby and McGuire, McGuire played our game. Um, the number of seeds um, that you got at the end. So people got really competitive about this. I mean, in some cases, scarily so. So we didn't, we didn't anticipate it to be a competitive game, but people were like, how many seeds did you get? 20. And then the other person's like, I got 22. And they're like rubbing it in their face. And you know, so kids will be kids. Uh, the other thing is I think it's, a, it's tempting to use this kind of thing as an assessment mechanism. No, no, you can't do it. Like, the number of seats that you get does not give you any indication of whether or not you have more mastery of the content. And this goes back to what I was talking about on Monday, for those of you who saw it, this idea of games that are clean assessment vehicles versus games that are, I guess the opposite of that would be dirty assessment vehicles. Reach for the Sun is definitely a dirty assessment vehicle because it's this kind of big complex system. This is in contrast to Do I Have a Right, which is a game that we made a long time ago for iCivics, um, which is essentially, you know, kind of you break it down to a series of, of choices that are ultimately multiple. And so you can actually make declarations about when you put when students play this game, whether or not they understand the Second Amendment, right? So very different types of games, very different types of outcomes in terms of assessment. Uh, when, we, when we engage in dialogue with the kids in the classroom after the gameplay experience, um, they put on their designer hats and they get really engaged and they say, you know, very critical, they say, this is what I would have done differently in the game, this is what I thought worked, this is what I thought didn't work. And then afterwards, in many cases, the teacher will bring out a worksheet as a follow-up exercise. And, and the dialogue is just, is this going to be on the test? So it was really cool to see those two things in contrast to each other, the level of engagement and how the students were engaging as designers. I think the other thing is that some of the students struggle, a lot of students we saw really struggled with this idea that traditional instructional materials are very explicit, like this worksheet. It's like, you do this worksheet and you know what Xylem is, you can prove that you know what Xylem is. And it relates directly to what you're going to be quizzed on on Friday. Whereas you play a game like Reach for the Sun, it's this, the system full of concepts that we're trying to teach you. And a lot of students actually can't understand initially how that's a learning experience because it's so different from what they're used to. Okay. What do we walk away from this experience learning? Uh, so we did a number of different pilot studies, um, but a lot of the data that I've been talking about uh, today has, is from this particular one. We had 79th graders, and yeah, a whole bunch of them agreed that the game was good, and they thought it was fun. And almost everybody thought the teacher should continue to use it the following year. All right, pat on the back to us, wonderful job. But here's the thing, is that you ask them whether or not they want to play it once they leave school, and it's like you lose half of them right off the bat. And at first your feelings are hurt, you're like, oh man, why do you want to play this game when you go home? It's so awesome. <laughs> but the reality is that it actually is kind of moot, right? Because I love my job, it doesn't mean I want to do it when I go home. It's a different type of experience, it's meaningful to me. Uh, during one part of the day, and during the other part of the day, I want to do something totally different with my brain. The other thing that we learned is that a lot of our customers, aka teachers and administrators, couldn't necessarily tell the difference between a game like Reach for the Sun, which took us many, many months to create, and some of the games that took us far less time to create. So for example, all of these games we created in the same amount of time that it took us to create Reach for the Sun. Um, and as far as the customer is concerned, there's not actually really a discernible difference between them. The game obviously would have been better with zombies. I mean, <laughs> this is taken for granted. And of course, the game also would have better with some explicit scaffolding put in it that caused the student to actively and critically reflect on what they're doing at any given time. And this goes back to what I was saying about some of the students having difficulty reflecting and, and thinking of it as a learning experience. If there were junctures in the game where we said, you know, why did you just do what you did? Um, they might be able to relate that to a more academic experience, for better or for worse. Okay, going forward. So as I mentioned, we started making a lot of smaller games. The idea here is that instead of making a big game and then taking it in the classroom and finding out that it doesn't work the way we want it to, we are making much smaller games uh, according to lean methodology and getting them out into the classroom, getting them in front of teachers, getting them in front of students, and either persevering, pivoting, or killing them. Um, and the result of this process has been really fruitful so far. So for example, um, with Reach for the Sun, we spent, as I, met, as I mentioned, many, many months in development, took it in the classroom, and did what we call good news tests. You hope it's good news because you're out of money. You just spent all your money and all of your time on the project. If it's not good news, then, then you're in trouble. 
this is in direct contrast to what we call bad news test, which is where you actually want to go into the classroom and you want to hear that things aren't working so that you can inform what you're going to do next. And you haven't made much of an investment in the process yet, so that's okay. Bad news is good. Um, and the result of this process has been, has, has been really terrific. I think the big challenge has been the fact that we can actually create game content faster than we can get feedback from educators. So that's something that we're working on. The last thing that we're working on is, is building on and off ramps to this content. So we're building curriculum materials around the games uh, that tell, give a teacher a sense of what they could do before the game as an, as an activity to sort of prime the students and then after the game to kind of debrief. Uh, this is an example of a, of a different game called uh, Backyard Engineers. Um, which we've created some curriculum around, and we are just about to do that for Return of the Sun. Uh, so this is it. Um, if you're interested in watching a documentary about the making of, you can see uh, some of the artists and some of the programmers who work on the game talking about the process. You can go to filmicgames.com forward slash products, Return of the Sun product. And that's it. Thanks, everybody.